The littlest Jeep arrives, and from Italy. The results are in on automatic braking technology and what capacitors are about to modernize under your hood. It's time to check the tech. We see cars differently. Nice. We love them on the road and under the hood, but also check the tech and are known for telling it like it is. Ugly is included at no extra cost. The good, the bad, the bottom line. This is CNET on Cars. Welcome to CNET on Cars, the show all about high-tech cars and modern driving. I'm Brian Cooley. Well, Jeep sales have been on a tear the last couple of years, nicely timed with a lineup that emphasizes SUVs and crossovers right about the time Americans rushed back to them post-recession and post-soaring fuel prices. But to my eye, the most interesting story coming out of Jeep happens to be on the small end, the little, almost pocketable renegade. Let's drive this Italian Jeep and check the tech. The new Jeep Renegade has the undeniable appeal of a Hot Wheels car. It's cool, compact, and craveable. And we have the top of the line, the Trailhawk. Let's check the tech. When I saw this Jeep Renegade get unveiled at the Geneva Motor Show back in 2014, I was pretty sure we were looking at a three-quarter scale mock-up so they could get it to fit up on the stand there. And this actually shares a platform with the Fiat 500X. It's a subcompact, but with real all-wheel drive as its passport into this very busy sector of the auto biz. These Renegades are made right alongside Fiat's at an FCA plant in Melfi, Italy. In a sense, you're getting an American icon and an Italian car for under 30 grand. Can't do that with a Pantera. Now inside the Renegade, I get the feeling that they're trying to emphasize its Jeepness to take your mind off its Italianness and its smallness. The Jeep shtick is everywhere. It's here, it's here, it's here, and it's there. There are several available Uconnect head units on the Renegade. Ours is an upscale six and a half inch touchscreen, also voice driven. We've seen and liked this guy before, mostly for its simple, almost cartoony interface. It's got highly rated, easy to use Garmin navigation. There are a handful of familiar apps you can load if the app store itself ever loads. And a Wi-Fi hotspot can be configured in this car as well. An interesting sunroof option called MySky. It powers back like most, but then you can also pop out the front and or rear panels entirely to get a really big hole, obstructed, however, by a structural bar. Under the hood, our high trim Trailhawk version has the big engine, and even that's only 2.4 liters and four cylinders. Does 180 horsepower and 175 pound-feet of torque through a nine-speed automatic only. Average MPG is 24. In addition to blind spot technology, you can also option a Renegade with forward collision technology that will actively brake for you and active lane departure technology that will steer you back in your lane. Those are unusual in this class. On the road, I'm afraid to report, no. The drive behavior of this powertrain is rubbery and loopy. They've made a 2.4 feel like a 1.4 and made a nine speed automatic feel like a CVT, but neither of those is admirable. Of course, on the positive side, we have real all-wheel drive underneath, including on this particular Renegade, a 20 to 1 crawl mode. Of course, you've got all-wheel drive lock, you've got real low range, and it's got different approach, departure, skid pans front and rear, even bright red tow hooks. This is a serious off-roader, not just an all-wheel drive vehicle. It's of note that even a 4x4 Renegade like this can be a true front-wheel drive vehicle unless you need all four driven. It physically disconnects the rear drive until needed all in interest of less drag and better fuel economy. Now under our Renegade, we have the first use of Kony's frequency selective damping shocks. These mechanically change their firmness based on the frequency of the inputs coming up through the wheels. That way they'll be ideal for handling on smooth roads, but be more comfortable and forgiving on bad ones, all without expensive electronic adaptive suspension. I found the handling on smooth corners was quite good. The ride quality on choppy pavement was kind of choppy. In sum, the Renegade looks great, drives like hell, but that's not going to hurt its sales prospects. It's entering just about the hottest category in the U.S. auto market, and it's a Jeep. Find our full review on that new Jeep Renegade, all new model for Jeep, at cars.cnet.com. 
One of the most interesting pieces of self-driving technology that's already here is the ability of many cars to automatically brake when they detect a collision that maybe you don't detect, saving your bacon and directly adding to the bottom line of safety on the road. But how well does it really work? We have some early answers for the smarter driver when CNET on Cars returns. In everyday driving, nothing is more fundamental to avoiding a collision than stopping before you have one. But too often, humans are, well, human, and don't break in time or at all. That's where forward collision avoidance technology comes in and ideally appears in cars we really buy, not just as a pricey option on pricey ones. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety has been watching forward collision technology come down to earth in three flavors. There's the warning. Warning you of a forward collision. Pre-charging the brakes before a collision to increase their effectiveness when you do get on them. If it detects a high risk of impact, the system will prime the brakes to help you stop more quickly. And automatic braking, so the car will pull itself partially or fully to a stop, even if you drop the ball. And there's the auto brake. The vehicle stopped by itself. Just two years ago, nearly three quarters of new cars didn't offer any kind of forward collision tech. Just two model years later, the number lacking it is down to under half, though just 4% of models offer it standard. Of a variety of cars that offer this tech, 10 models from Acura, BMW, Mazda, and Chrysler earned a superior rating with five or six out of six points. A separate study by the Highway Loss Data Institute found that two models of Volvos from 2010 to 2012 with automatic braking had insurance claim rates that were 15 to 16% lower. And the latest Volvos offer the first automatic braking that will intervene if you're about to make a very ill-advised left turn against traffic. It pays to double check if your next car offers forward collision tech, what if any degree of self-braking it includes, and how well the whole system is rated to actually work. It's a fundamental feature that could pay for itself pretty easily the first time you don't rear-end someone. Welcome back to CNET On Cars, coming to you from our home at the Mount Tam Motor Club, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Most electricity stored in your car today is either in its 12-volt battery that runs the starter, lights, and ignition, or in a big motive battery if your car is an EV or a plug-in hybrid. But there is another way, in a capacitor. Capacitors, or CAPs, store electricity like batteries, but differing in four major ways. First, they charge really fast. Second, they discharge or deliver electricity really fast. Both of those behaviors because, unlike your car's battery, capacitors store electricity as electricity, not as a chemical soup that contains electric potential. Thirdly, CAPs are light, no lead plates and acid solution. And fourth, they laugh at extreme weather. But traditionally, one big downside has kept capacitors out of a car's powertrain, and that is low energy density. Capacitors have usually held a small fraction of the energy found in a car battery and took up a lot of space to do that. Enter ultra capacitors. These have a much higher energy density, so they can do more work and yet still fit inside today's tight engine bays and other locations. And their time seems to have arrived on the coattails of new car tech, like automatic start-stop, electronic adaptive suspension, and electric turbos. Each of those demand a lot of new current that is delivered in as little as milliseconds, yet to preserve efficiency, want their power source to be recharged easily. Capacitors have that written all over them. Toyota's Supra HVR hybrid race car used a Supra cap in its powertrain to store power for an electric boost motor. And doing so, it won the Tokachi 24-hour race in 2007. A capacitor, which is like a battery but charges in seconds. More down to earth, Mazda's oddly named IE Loop tech in their cars today uses a capacitor but not to drive the car. In their case, they use it to power accessories and that takes load off the traditional harder to charge lead acid battery. IE Loop uses a special alternator that freewheels when the engine moves the car. But the moment you let off the gas, it wakes up to turn outgoing energy into electricity. Capacitors themselves are nothing new. 
but supercapacitors being found under the hood likely will be. In a moment, your email, how to survive a rollover with technology, and nitrogen or air in your tires when CNET on Cars returns. The Panamera has everything in it I want from a Porsche. It's got performance, handling, power, and yes, the looks as well. But on top of that, it's got room for my kids in the back and all the luggage we could possibly throw at it. This is the Porsche for the real world. Find more from the XCAR team of CNET UK at CNET.com slash XCAR. Welcome back to CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. It's that time on the show when I take a few of your emails. First one I've got here is coming up from Hari, who has a question about nitrogen inflation of tires. He asked, what difference does it make in fuel economy and mileage, the life of the tire, and the ride quality of the car if you fill your tires with nitrogen instead of the more commonly available and universally used atmospheric air? Well, Hari, the nitrogen in tires thing comes down to two fundamental differences from air. The first is larger molecules, and this means the nitrogen molecule is just bigger than the molecules of air you get at the standard pump. Those larger molecules have a harder time escaping through the microporosity, the slight leakage that every rubber tire has, especially old tires. That means they hold their pressure longer without you having to refill them. The other key thing is that nitrogen has less moisture. It's almost absolutely dry. What happens with regular air in your tires is as you drive, the tire heats up from friction and deforming all the time. That causes the moisture in the air to expand, of course, and that causes the tire's overall pressure to go up. And then when you park and the tire gets cold, it goes back down. You're always doing this with tire pressure. Nitrogen doesn't really have that problem. It's very stable on tire pressure. And that consistent pressure is good because you want to maintain an optimal rolling resistance to get better fuel economy and have the tire handle and deform the way it's designed to. Now a reality check. This is not a really big deal. The amount of change in pressure from that moisture in regular air has been factored in for ages by manufacturers and tire makers. That's why you get this thing called cold PSI. It tells you where to inflate your tires when they are cold and have not been driven a lot at freeway speeds, for example. As far as those larger molecules escaping, um, it's definitely a bonus, but air escapes very slowly in modern tires, wheels, valves, and valve stems. It's not something you can't keep on top of by merely checking your tires once a month. That's all you've got to do. Once a quarter will probably do it, actually. And therefore, my recommendation on nitrogen is this. If you get new tires and they put it in, great. If you've got an easy, cheap source to keep adding it, eh, I guess that's worth it. But otherwise, I would just invest in a tire gauge and check your tires just occasionally, and you'll be absolutely fine. Now, it is important to keep your tires at the right pressure, though. If you have a 25% drop in tire pressure, it equals over 16% increased rolling resistance. That's substantial. Also, an underinflated tire gets a lot hotter when it's driving than one that's properly inflated, and that causes more yo-yo effect of the pressure in the tire that fatigues the tire sooner, and an underinflated tire is dangerous when it comes to vehicle stability on the road. So keep those tires pumped up at the right pressure, but you don't need nitrogen to get any of this done. Thomas D. writes in with a question about an accident he was in recently and technology that could have made it a little less grisly. He says, I was a passenger in a car involved in a rollover crash. Due to the seat belt, I sustained compression fractures in my spine and says he had a broken sternum as well. I went back, he says, to examine the car before they crushed it. And it appeared as though the back tire was also underinflated, which could have contributed to the flip. I seem to recall on your show seeing a technology that allowed the seat to absorb some of the impact taken by pushing down in the seat during certain kinds of accidents. And he wants to know what that technology was. Well, first of all, Thomas, you're thinking about a Volvo technology we covered recently in their new SUV. And this has got the kind of odd, awkward name of runoff road protection. It uses a compressible structure in the bottom of the seat so that when a car leaves the road and lands hard, perhaps on a lower plane or on any other surface, that the seat will crush down toward the floor, taking that force that normally would be offloaded to your spine, as you know all too well. It also has a technology that snugs up the belt in the milliseconds of the impact 
keeping you from having any slop to the belt. You may have had a situation in your crash where the belt was a little loose, it locked, and then you slammed against it. That often can cause chest injuries. Helicopter seats have done something similar to what Volvo's doing. They've done that for decades where they have this variable crush zone underneath. They do it with elaborate shock absorbers and levers because sometimes helicopters come in on hard landings, especially when they auto-rotate. Now you told me in a subsequent email you were in a 2007 model year car. I'm not going to get into the make and model of it because I don't think it's actually germane to the discussion. But I do want to point out three model year milestones everyone should be aware of. Three things that happened starting with 2007. Cars in the U.S. were required to have TPMS, the Tire Pressure Monitoring System. That means that the tires and wheels monitor their pressure and report it in to a small display somewhere on the instrument panel. That's U.S. law. In 2009, we got the requirement of new rollover standards. Vehicles went from having to take one and a half times their own weight on their roof to surviving three times their own weight on their roof. That's a big difference in keeping that vehicle a safe cocoon around you in a rollover accident like you were in. And the third thing I want to call out is 2012 was the milestone when electronic stability control became required on all new U.S. cars. Now, it was very common before that, but required as of 2012. These three, to me, sort of draw a line in the sand of late model used cars where I'm going to make sure I've got all three of those, which pushes me out to around 2010 or later to get a car that's really loaded up on these critical technologies, especially for the kind of accident you were in. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Appreciate your emails in particular. Keep those coming. It's oncars at cnet.com. I'll see you next time we check the deck.